part three of our Meet the Collectors series. Um, I'm Mary Manley from the Sheldon Museum and this has been a really fun project because the exhibit that this is in conjunction with that we opened in the spring when we first opened again finally reopened um, features as you all probably know probably about 30 objects from individual collections here in Addison County and when we asked everybody we asked the community if you have something to share you get to pick one item and of course that was just how do you pick one item out of a collection your precious collection it was hard but everybody did quite well on that and um, so we're really pleased to share that exhibit along with having this series of talks so we invited some of the collectors who said they'd be interested in speaking to come to one of these sessions so today we have four collectors um, Sass Carey is going to talk about her Mongolian collection which is amazing and I should say that we were amazed at how international this exhibit became um, all continents but uh, Antarctica are represented so it shows that people in Addison County travel and live other places um, we weren't specific to Vermont although some are from Vermont um, Bruce Yelton as an example is going to talk about the East Middlebury ironworks um, and then uh, Diana Bigelow is an artist among other things and she has created these amazing characters, uh, personalities, out of some of the things that she finds when she goes to the beach or other places. So you'll see the materials that, that, that Diana uses for her collection. And then Sarah Fox is here with her little helper Tom over there. And <coughs> Sarah, and soon he'll be a collector, I'm sure. Um, and Sarah has an amazing large collection of Blue Heaven China. She's been collecting for 15 years, so she's going to share her pursuit of Blue Heaven China. So without further ado, I will mention, if you're not a member of the Sheldon and you haven't yet seen the exhibit, or if you're a member, there's no admission charge. But if you're not a member, we encourage you to join. But in the meantime, uh, Stephanie Skenyon, our executive director, has some passes, so you may go up if you haven't seen the show yet. Or we've also got a brand new, um, beautiful uh, exhibit featuring archival objects, uh, ephemera, um, but artists who made collage works, focusing on our collection, which is amazing. So if you haven't seen that yet, definitely go in. So we're going to start off with SAS and go to Mongolia. It ain't SAS. Well, I already had a couple of questions, and one was, how did I get there? So, um, I do energy healing, I live in Middlebury, and one of my clients came and she said, had this book that she had just read called Encounters with Qi by David Eisenberg, and he had been in China, he was a, working at, he was a doctor at Harvard, and he had lived in China and learned about Chinese medicine, and she said, you really need to go to China and learn about energy there because they've been practicing it for 5,000 years. So I said, yeah, sure, but I don't have any money. And she said, we started talking about it and I ended up giving her seven years of treatments, energy healing treatments that she gave me $5,000 and I went with the American Holistic Nurses Association. And that trip included Mongolia, which I never imagined in my life. I have a lot of people come up to me and say, oh, I always wanted to go to Mongolia. I never wanted to go to Mongolia. <laughs> but it happened, and there I was. And since I did energy healing, I stepped off the plane onto the ground, and I felt the energy just go like that, like electricity. And so um, I knew there was something that I was supposed to do there, but I didn't know exactly what it was. So that was in 1994, and I've been 19 times since then, and I've studied traditional Mongolian medicine um, for three and a half months. Um, Kathleen Scacciaferro in Bristol and I were the first two Westerners ever to be trained in Mongolian medicine. And uh, then I worked for the United Nations in water sanitation and hygiene, and the interesting thing that happened with as a health educator, and the interesting thing Hello, Trish. The interesting thing that happened with that was um, <coughs> that these women in the Gobi, we asked them how much water they used, and they said five liters a day. Well, this was in 1997, and one flush of the, our toilet was five liters of water. So it kind of sat with me, and then I was meditating. I'm a Quaker, and I was meditating one day, and it came to me that I really needed to make a movie about how they live if they only have five liters of water a day. So I went back and I made my first movie, even though I've never been trained as a filmmaker. Um, 
and I went to the Gobi and uh, interviewed some women, went out to the gares. These are gares. This is um, a, the, a yurt or gare, they call it gare. And this is what it looks like inside. It has a lattice work. And this is the men's side and the women's side and the spiritual side. And um, that's about it, I guess, <laughs> what I wanted to say about that. But it's all, oh, I know. And that everything, they always face the gear south so that west and right are the same word and left and east are the same word because you're always oriented looking out to the south and the gear. Okay. So that's where they live. So we went out there and um, filmed a movie, and we filmed a birth. And I thought, well, what could be more of what Gobi women than a birth? I mean, so we did that. That was in 2001. Um, went back in 2002 and three. And then um, I asked the doctor there. <laughs> I asked the doctor there. Um, if she could have anything she wanted, what would she like? And she said she'd like to have a laboratory. In those hospitals in the, in the countryside in Mongolia, there was no running water. I mean, obviously, no telephone, no heat, just wood heat. Um, the bathroom was, you know, a long way away. And nothing for, for materials, nothing. I mean, not even a microscope. So she said, I would like a laboratory. And I said, what would you like? She said, I'd like to be able to test blood and urine and have a microscope. And so we scoured New England. I, we started a nonprofit called Nomadicare, Nomad Eye Care. And we scoured New England and we got lots of donations um, of centrifuges, both for blood and for urine. And we got microscopes and we gave them to some hospitals. And uh, then we did a training in uh, the South Gobi. This isn't about my collection, I guess, but um, <laughs> South Gobi. And we um, trained about uh, 28 doctors in traditional medicine and in laboratory safety techniques. And then we went up to the north near Siberia, Hufsko province, and we did the same thing with 50 doctors. So that part. Then I started, um, I was invited to go up to the reindeer herders um, in the north, right near Siberia. And um, be because of being able to I'm a nurse, you know, I know Western medicine, I knew Mongolian medicine a little bit, and they wanted help, more health care out there. Um, so I was invited up and I went in 2003, and I kept going and going and going, and then I wrote this book, Reindeer Herders in My Heart, and then I made some more movies. Um, one is called Migration, and one is called Transition, and, and then the latest one, and, and Ceremony about shamans. Then I made one more about the Gobi, Gobi Children's Song, and that's the last one. And uh, it's this month, it, there'll, be sh there'll be one shown in Connecticut, and one in Denmark, and um, one in um, Moldova, and one in, um, let me see, oh yeah, virtually. Okay, so then, this is part of my collection, and these are reindeer antlers, and the herders make them, and they make them for um, tourists. They call everybody tourists who goes there. I know I go and help them and hang out and I know them and all. But at the end, when, when a big tour group is leaving the settlement, they put everything down on the ground on a canvas, canvas uh, cloth. And everybody has their own little, um, little carvings in front and then all the tourists buy some and then you, they use them for buying. Mostly they're subsistence but they buy flour and they buy um, they little, use a lot of flour. They buy flour, rice and those kind of things um, for their life, lives. So they also make these. These are um, <coughs> these are more carvings that they make for uh, like this, and um, so I I bring them at home and I um, put them. They go to the nonprofit and then they all go to work that work with them. So um, let's see what else can I tell you? 
I know you want questions at the end, but yeah, we were thinking of doing questions at the much, end. How much time do I have left? Oh gosh, you have. Uh, I'm fat. I do you have fast. like three minutes, four minutes. Okay, okay. Well, <laughs> oh, I can show you the hats. Okay, so these are hats. This is a woman's hat, and um, oh yeah, I really wanted to talk about the costume. Um, this costume is called a del, D-E-E-L, and it's lined with cotton and it wraps around and it is really a fantastic article of clothing because you can put it on and once you put the belt on you can store all your things right in your pocket up here a big pocket sometimes you see people like this you know just <laughs> full of everything sometimes you see a baby in there sometimes you see a, a lamb in there you know <laughs> or a baby reindeer or something so um they use for that and they're, they're kind of warm, you know, use them for blankets. And since there are no bathrooms out in the countryside, they use them for their toilet, you know, they just cover themselves, they have their own outhouse, right, in their clothes. And um, what else do they use? It's, it's, it's a fantastic piece of, oh, it's really nice to ride a horse because you can um, tuck this side and each side, and, like over your legs and just be really covered and warm when you're riding, because when we, we go up to the reindeer herders, we have to ride horses five or eight hours, depending on the settlement. This is a, um, a llama's hat, and this is a, a llama's hat, or Buddhist llama, and this one, this is the one they wear every day, you know, they, and sometimes they wear them with the flaps down when it's colder, so, and, um, the, this is this is kind of a wedding uh, or a fancy headdress that a woman would use. It looks much better without white hair under it. But <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is, of course, politically incorrect in the U.S., but they use a lot of animal <laughs> things because they're hunters and gatherers, and uh, this is red fox. And, yeah, it's really warm, and it's really cold there, so they need... They need that kind of thing. Here's another hat. I tried to find for. See, I was, I did a, a um, three month training up with the uh, Lincoln School, and I did it with New Haven too. And so that was just before COVID, and I. The kids love trying on costumes. I have lots of costumes, and so I got lots of costumes last time I went, and then we had COVID, so they haven't even seen these yet. But they were crazy about the boots. Um, and the boots always have the point go up in the front because they don't want to disturb, disturb the land, the step. So you'll notice that it's... We can't see it because of a... You, um, and some of the boots are even go up more, are curled up more in front than this. So this is sheepskin and a little bit of embroidery. And yeah, one more. Okay, let me think. What else? Um, so we have this. And, oh, the jackets. These are actually worn by men mostly, but um, the women wear them too. But it is a traditional thing. You see the herders when they're out with their animals. They're wearing this and this. And sometimes they have that hat on. Usually they have boots on. And that's, you know, they're riding their horse and they're, you know, guard, guiding their uh, herds to, to go um, where they want them to. Okay, that's it. Thank you, Seth. Thank you. You'll be able to come up and look at all of these items, so I think that'll be great. Bruce, would you like to go next? Sure. So Bruce Yelton and Ironworks. Oh, hello, everybody. Uh, Bruce Yelton, uh, my wife Debbie. Seven years ago, this month, uh, Debbie and I bought a 155-year-old house in East Middlebury. You ever see the movie The Money Pit? <laughs> we quickly uh, discovered that our new home uh, was lacking a few things that we took for granted, like insulation and heat. Right. Uh, uh, so, nevertheless, we were happy in our new home and we uh, did a balance of learning about carpentry and electrical skills. Uh, we explored the village of East Middlebury. 
And we quickly discovered the ruins of the East Middlebury Iron Works. You may have seen it, it's just, or you may know where it is, it's just below the Highway 125 bridge uh, there on the Middlebury River on the right as you're going up to Ripton. While I was bouldering this morning, I picked up a curious rock. Uh, it seemed unusual, and I realized pretty quickly that this is iron and iron slag. Some iron on the bottom and lots of slag on top. Uh, it's the waste product of iron making. I saw the gun, there was an iron mill hill here in East Middlebury. Take this off so I don't suck it. Um, so I, uh, I started talking uh, with Jack Brown, I mean, you may know Jack Brown, and he filled me in on the historic background of East Middlebury. Um, the Vermont that, that I know, known all my life, has been the green hills, pastures, cows, free-flowing rivers, but that's not really the history of certainly this part of Vermont. Uh, the early history was all about extraction. Lumber, charcoal, lime, tanning, and iron. Uh, beginning in the late 18th century and all the way through to the 20th century, East Middlebury hosted a profusion of industrial endeavors. And this little map that you can look at when you come up uh, shows uh, in the 1870s just in the short strip of river between uh, the ironworks of the bridge and uh, Schoolhouse Hill Road, there were a dozen different businesses, heavy industrial types of businesses. Uh, there was a carriage factory, a glass factory, multiple blacksmiths, sawmills, a toy factory, a window sash business, and at least two iron forges. Uh, I found two publications when I started getting interested in my works. Uh, one is called 200 Years of Soot and Sweat, which I thought was a really appropriate title. That's a history and archaeology of Vermont's iron, charcoal, and lime industries. And the other is a 2005 uh, report, archaeological report, from before they put in the bridge, uh, they did an archaeological investigation of the iron works. Um, Two forges in, in, there were two forges in East Middlebury. Uh, they're both bloomery for, forges. The earliest forge, the Eagle, was actually above where the bridge is currently sited now. Uh, it washed away in 1831, and I've looked. There's, there are no, there's no trace of it left. That very same year, the East Middlebury Forge was built, uh, 1831. Opened up in 1831, and it operated from 1831 to 1890. Uh, in the 1860s, the facility there consisted of a large charcoal and workshed, a forge building containing three bloomery forges, each 16 feet tall, uh, each with its own water wheel, uh, one trip hammer, weighing 400 pounds, uh, a smaller water house and a dam, a water wheel house and a dam. Um, they used pin stocks to guide the water into, into the ironworks uh, to operate the mills. Uh, this illustration here, Back to this first one, gives you some idea of what the trip hammer and the uh, forges look like. Let's see. Uh, why were the ironworks in East Middlebury? For three reasons. Uh, one, water power. You needed water power to run the trip hammer and to cool the iron once it was made. Iron ore. Iron ore. The iron ore came from Crown Point across the lake in uh, New York. They mined it there, put it on a boat, took it across the river, and then it came by a uh, mule uh, wagon uh, here to Middlebury. And finally, the last thing uh, was charcoal. Uh, the river with, uh, charcoal was needed to extract the, uh, the iron from the ore. And the hardwood trees all around in Vermont at the time uh, seemed to provide what looked like an endless supply of charcoal. Uh, unlike other parts of the country where charcoal was really expensive uh, and blast furnaces were used that were fired by coal, uh, they, even though they provided a higher quality of iron at the end, 
they were really expensive and complicated to operate. Bloomery forges were pretty cheap and they produced uh, a one stage product that was really in high demand at the time. Think about the 1830s, 40s. What did you need? You needed nails. So they made nails. Uh, they needed, you needed metal buckles for harness. You needed door hinges. So things that people were really in high demand reproduced by these iron forges. Uh, the charcoal for, to run the mills came actually from Ripton. There were several, several large charcoal grill, uh, kilns in uh, Ripton. So how do you make the iron? Well, you load up one of the forges with uh, 270 bushels of charcoal and about two tons, uh, excuse me, and let's see, four tons of iron ore, and that would produce two tons of raw iron. So you can imagine there's three forges working every day at 270 bushels of forge. It was a huge amount of charcoal. The net profit is interesting. In the 1840s, it cost about 40 bucks to produce a ton of iron. And the net profit on that 40 bucks was about 10 bucks. So uh, Chapman, who was the owner, Mr. Chapman, who was the only works, owner of the works in the 1840s, uh, reported producing 385 tons of iron between 1846 and 1848. The equivalent today of that 385 tons of iron is about $145,000. So it was a pretty good deal. Uh, a new owner in the 1850s, James Slade, reported sales of $15,000. Uh, in a single year, he improved the works quite a bit. And that would be the equivalent of $540,000 today. It's also interesting that in 1850, 1850, the works employed 10 men, and they made an average wage of $40 a month, which is, <laughs> which is the equivalent of about $380 a week now. So it wasn't a lot of money. It was basically a minimum wage job. And it was, as we might imagine, noisy, dangerous, and dangerous. So from the 1850s to the 1870s, there were several uh, bloomeries here in Addison County. Um, there was one in West Lincoln, there was one in Fairhaven, there was one in Salisbury, and one in Virginia. Um, there was growing competition during this time uh, from national iron producers. Uh, East Middlebury, the East Middlebury Works, like others, shifted their emphasis from producing raw iron to the manufacture of finished goods from pig iron that was produced elsewhere and then brought here. Uh, as a matter of fact, we have here an example of a piece from the East Millbury Works. This is, anybody know what this is? It's Lordbury. I'm sorry? Lordbury. Close, but not quite. This, this was a patented, this one, this was built in 1873, and made in 1873, and it is what is called a stove pipe warmer. So you took your, you stuck this in your stove pipe, then you stuck the other pipe on top, and you could put whatever you wanted, bread, whatever, uh, up here to stay warm. It's a pretty practical idea. Let's see. You don't even know about this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> they made a variety of things, just what that part says. So that everything, again, from nails to finished wrought iron products like this. By the time of its close, and the mill closed down in 1890, East Middlebury uh, Iron Works found itself unable to compete with larger, more efficient works in the South and the Midwest. And the economy of Vermont began to shift again uh, back to the romantic, back-to-nature tourist industry. And of course, in East Middle Area, we have quite a few uh, tourist remnants of uh, tourist cabins uh, that were built in between the 1890s and World War I. Uh, the close of this heavily extractive, dangerous, dirty, polluting period of Vermont's history cannot be overly mourned. It's easy to imagine the cacophony of the trip hammers, the billowing black smoke, the heat, 
the strained men and animals that were involved in producing this iron. However, it can't be doubted that the economic contribution of the mill during its 60 years of operation uh, added greatly to the development of Addison County. And I think we have to admire the ingenuity and the dedication of the individuals who worked in these mills, because it was nasty work. Uh, I think it's very appropriate that this piece of Vermont history is called 200 Years of Soot and Sweat, because that pretty much sums it up. So, in conclusion, uh, information about the site uh, is included in the second edition of the East Middlebury Walking Tour, the historical walking tour. Uh, now has 27 different locations on it, available for people to buy this edition at any price. <laughs> Income uh, from the sale of the books is going to, and donations are going to be used to erect a sign at the site commemorating and recording uh, the history of the Thanks. Mm -hmm. About 15 years ago, I was running a day program for uh, someone in the community, and he and I went thrifting at the old ACAG, the New Hope, um, and I found a set of dinner plates um, in this pattern, and I thought they were so cool, uh, and I quickly brought them home and looked them up on the internet. Um, most of the time, they're marked on the back, so I had the information, um, and discovered that they were uh, made in Ohio in the 60s um, by the Royal China Company. Um, they were uh, used as prizes. Um, you would go to the grocery store and collect coupons and then trade them in for all these things. Um, and so they made a ton. Um, so throughout the 60s, they made this set, uh, glasses, teapots, teacups, I mean every, everything that you would need for a, a, a fabulous 60s party. Um, and then they also made uh, the same pattern in green, which now is significantly harder to find um, and typically much more expensive. Um, occasionally, uh, I will find someone who doesn't know sort of what they have. Uh, I think this I paid about two bucks for on the internet um, and I cried because I was so excited. Um, so they did this and then in the 70s uh, the company was bought out by Fire King and Fire King started making the same pattern on milk glass. And so they started making ramekins and loaf pans and French onion soup yeah. cups um, and I have pretty much an entire set of everything at this point. I think I have eight creamers uh, yeah. because whenever I see them, I buy them uh, immediately. Um, we've recently retired the uh, Fire King because there, there's been a bunch of articles about lead in milk glass. Um, and unfortunately, not great for kids, right? <laughs> you make them friends. Um, <laughs> But I can't bring myself to, to completely get rid of them. So we have, um, we also, I typically, I, I had used throughout my 20s, uh, this is my sort of standard uh, dish set, uh, which has gotten a little bit more complicated with kids who break things, and, <laughs> which is also how I rationalize having eight creamers or three water pitchers, because I figure if one breaks, it's not a big deal. Um, the other cool thing about this pattern is that there is a crazy amount of um, sort of weird one-off plates. Uh, <laughs> so this is just an example, and this particular plate also spawned a sort of sub-collection of just Kennedy-related items. Um, I now have a lot of Kennedy plates, uh, not in this pattern. In this pattern, there are four. Um, I also have some plates with horses on them. Um, I am not a horse person, uh, but again, if I see them, it's like the greatest thing. Um, there isn't a lot of sort of history about these particular 
uh, sort of fashion plates, I guess. Um, so I don't know what exists. And occasionally I have a, a search set up for eBay uh, that I'll check every now and then. For the most part, my, my collection was sourced at thrift stores um, or antique malls, but every now and then something like this pops up. Um, and some pretty standard ones, there's uh, a couple Jesus plates, some Mary plates, but no record of them. And so recently I found one with a uh, Masonic symbol that I unfortunately paid a lot of money for, but it's mine. Um, <laughs> I've never seen one before and I, I don't, it probably will never find one again. Um, but pretty standard 60s stuff. So. Um, if you've seen plates like this, the one that we have in the uh, upstairs is the calendar plate, the 1965 calendar plate. Pretty standard uh, when it comes to old dishes. And this company did make a lot of other very recognizable patterns. Um, Royal China did Courier and Ives, they did some willow ware, um, the pie plates with recipes for a particular kind of pie is Royal China. Um, and so they have a lot of that sort of um, art in the middle. Um, am I forgetting anything, Tom? <laughs> that's pretty, I mean, that's pretty much it. I, I have, I mean, it's, it's sort, of, sort of an embarrassing amount uh, <laughs> tucked away. Uh, when we bought our house in New Haven, there's a, a built-in cabinet that I took over instantly. Um, so yeah, I think that's it. Did you mention the name of the, of the? Oh, the, the pattern is called Blue Heaven. Um, the green version is called Green Mojave. Um, and again, this particular colorway is very different. Um, I have now probably a full set of those dishes, not with the sort of teapots and things, but um, as far as like plates, teacups and saucers. Uh, the company did a, what, a what, from what I can tell, um, a mold of teapots, tea, tea cups, things like that. Um, and then the color colors depend on the pattern. So there are um, something called uh, Star Bright, which is another very recognizable 60s pattern. So it's the same shape, but the main sort of serving pieces are in that colorway, and it's called the Future Align. Um, so all the teapots are the same shape, but Star Bright is mustard, Blue Heaven is blue, um, that kind of thing, and that way they can sort of capitalize on, on the molds. Um, the company itself, I still find um, pretty regularly, less so in Vermont, outside, um, and I would imagine in the Midwest is probably more sort of prolific given that they were made in Ohio, um, and the grocery stores that really sold them were in um, Wisconsin, things like that, at a, a chain called the Red Owl, um, which I don't think exists anymore. And, uh, yeah. Can I ask you a question? Is that okay? Sure, go. Um, so my parents had that. I want to, I love it. Okay. Yeah. I like when I walked in, I just went, oh my God. I have a lot. I grew yeah. up with that. But here's my question. How lucky. I, I know. <laughs> I guess. I didn't know. <laughs> you didn't know. But, but um, I'm pretty sure that my parents had like that Corel wear. Mm -hmm. Do you know that kind of weird stuff? Yeah, that doesn't corn, break. Corn, yeah. yeah, and I don't think so. I don't think we had China with that. Do you think they would have, been, or am I misremembering? I mean, I don't want to. No, that's fine. I don't want to tell, but yes, no, you're definitely misremembering. This, okay, um, it was China. That it stuff, China. that, um, the corning wear is the small blue is the very okay. famous one. Um, those are a little easier to find these days, okay. um, the, yeah, they are, and they're much more sort of indestructible, which is probably yes. part of it. These are pretty hardy. Um, my husband drops them regularly and they tend not to break. And when they do, I use them for like, you know, plant, like saucers for planters and things like that. Um, the corning wear is a little bit less expensive because you can find it more frequently. Um, these but things wouldn't so, have been that pattern. I don't. It's very similar, and a lot of people who know yeah. one will have yeah. seen the other. I got you. Um, I'm sure it was that. That was what I saw as a kid. Some of them are easier to, f like some pieces are easier to find. Um, they do have a line of glasses, like clear juice glasses, highball glasses, um, which I 
through years of searching have a full set of, um, and they are stupidly expensive now. Um, you can normally get uh, four or five of them for like $100, which for, is just a lot of money to spend on something that's going to break. Um, and probably also has lead in it, my <laughs> husband would like to add. Um, but yes, frequently you'll see one is very synonymous with the other. I know. We're all done. Good job, ben. Thank you. Well, as you can see, everybody's passionate about their collections. So now I'd like to turn the program over to Diana Bigelow, who is going to share a totally different type of collection. A totally different kind of collection. So I have to thank Mary, particularly, for being willing to sort of tuck me in with all of the rest of these wonderful people. Because what I do is I, I sort of have a collection at two levels. So my first level of collection is sticks, stones, shelves, and bones. Okay, so what I've done is I brought a couple of things which I'm happy to pass around. These are the small things that I collect. So when I walk on the beach, in Ocracoke, North Carolina, or I walk in the desert of Tucson, or I walk up on the trail to the ledges and back in my house, I always have my eyes open for something interesting that kind of pops out of me that I could make something with. And sometimes the thing that I make, um, that I see, is already made. It's, it, it's its own thing. I, all I have to do is bring it um, and bring it back and put it in my house. So that's the first level of collection that I have. And the second level is that I'm, I have, over particularly um, recently, because of the pandemic, and I've been, as many of you, all of you probably have been, restricted in terms of where I could go, what I could do. I've taken myself um, with my trusty glue gun to my um, to the top of my dryer and my uh, washing machine in the kitchen, plug in and start putting these things together to make something, which has been lots of fun for me. So, what I've made is, and I'll pass this around too, because I, and I'm, I have two people to introduce in my program. One is my husband, Jim Stapleton, who's over there. And um, I feel a little bit like we're the walking wounded today. <laughs> but I'm not responsible for Jim's black eye. <laughs> he actually went to the dermatologist, and you probably know what that might lead to. And I went to the river yesterday with my friend Suzanne Peck and got stung with a wasp. So I look a little bit puffy here. Several so, times. Several right? times. So uh, having gotten to Suzanne, I will say that I've now made probably over a hundred creatures, which is what I call them. And Suzanne, being a wonderful photographer, agreed to come and help me make pictures of them so that I could make this book. So I'm going to pass this around to you. And the other thing that I do, and because I introduced my husband, is I make, these are some of the creatures that I have. Okay, so this one, um, I typically name them. But every once in a while, Jim comes up with a real swell one. So this is Curly Boomschlag. <laughs> and what the reason I brought him is because the other thing my husband does is he's a wonderful storyteller, being an Irish fellow. Are there other Irish folk here? Who oh, may yes. know about the gift for Gab, the, the shenanigans, the, uh, the malarkey, let's put it that way. So Jim um, was, was kind enough when I suggested one time a friend actually came up with this idea. She said, gosh, we had a little exhibit of some of the things in the, in the Bristol Library, which is where we live. And a friend had a look at them and said, oh, God, you should make a story out of this. And I said, well, I'm not really a writer, but guess what? I live with one. <laughs> so I said, Jim, how about we sort of set up a little scene with half a dozen of these creatures that I've made, and we um, Make, take photographs of them and make a story. 
So over the, during the pandemic, mm. we came up with uh, seven or eight little books that we made and published through Shutterfly, mm. which is another. So I'll pass this around to you, you can get an mm. idea. Um, which, uh, I mean, I'm not a professional anything in this regard, um, but uh, it, it was a lot of fun, I mean, to, to, to come up for Jim to be uh, put on the spot, to come up with a story, and then how to use these, these uh, materials. So I was, uh, I was struck with what, is it Mary? She's not here, she just left. Sarah? What Mary said about having thing, a, a, a cover that she had, that all of her dishes began to occupy a lot of your cupboard space in your house. Sorry. That's all right, never mind. No, the no, point no. was made. And <laughs> what I've discovered is that in our house, my creatures are also beginning to take over the house. <laughs> <laughs> Which if you see there, there are a hundred creatures who are now in every room. They're taking over. And what's interesting though, so this is the second level of collections that I'm talking about. Because I really don't make them I don't make them for anyone really but myself and my own delight. So I'm not going to sell them. I'm not, you know, I'm not looking for a home for them. I've given them a home. <laughs> my husband, being a good sort, is willing to share. <laughs> so I, I can't think that there's any room in our house that doesn't uh, uh, include a, a number of these. Uh, so the family of creatures. So. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about how it all started, which the, these collection things, which was 50 years ago here in Vermont. My children, its grandparents, lived in Pulteney, Vermont, right on the Pulteney River. And one day, I think Jennifer was like maybe four, Eric might have been two. We were down there, summertime, sitting in the you know the little the shallows of the river. And I looked down, and I saw a rock. Okay, so I looked at this rock, and I said, wow, that looks to me like a grand piano. <laughs> All it needs is three legs <laughs> and the music stick. So I'll pass it around, you can have a look. So that was the beginning, it was like, oh, Eyes open, here I am looking around. And I want to be there for the kids anyway, you know, so here we are. So I began to put things together. In those days, there was only the very old fashioned glue, you know, that took a long time to dry. Um, but I managed with it, and um, so I made what will, if you look in at that book there, this one, you'll see go ahead, that. On page one, because the book sort of talks about the story, I made a whole dollhouse oh, out of stones wow. for my daughter. So this was her first dollhouse, <laughs> made by mom. Um, and, the, uh, <laughs> and the things from the Pulteney River. So that kind of got me going. And then we, you know, Jim and I, I'll pass this back, I don't know. Um, had uh, did some traveling, and we were going across the uh, driving across the country, and we stopped off I, uh, in a wonderful Native American cultural center. I think somewhere in the Dakotas, or it might have been Montana. Um, and I saw went through the exhibits, and I saw these wonderful um, toys that had been made for Native American. Uh, children and very simple bones, uh, sticks, very uh, skins, and it stuck in my mind, you know. And then several years later, when I was walking on the beach in uh, California, I looked down and there were some bones from probably a sea mammal of some sort, clean, you know, they'd been there for a long time. And I said, I wonder if I could make something like that. So I collected a few, and uh, in my spare time, 
I put together a couple of figures. And I was really a purist at the beginning, which was there was no glue involved. It was all going to be made with cat gut strings and you know holding <laughs> things together. But over time, uh, the, the, <laughs> there's a, you'll see, there are a couple of figures in here. Where are they? Where's my book? I'll see if I can find um, uh, The two that I made, the woman, Ma Simple, uh, began to be rather droopy looking because her, uh, the sinews began to droop. So, it happens to all of us. It happens to all of us. <laughs> Will you come to all of my presentations? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah, here she is. So here's Ma Simple. So this was, you know, this is Ma here, and uh, here's Pa over here. So eventually when I came, uh, you know, she was looking kind of like this. And so when I came back, we moved to, uh, to Vermont, the pandemic happened, and I discovered the glue gun. <laughs> Well, my life suddenly exploded with possibilities. The glue gun really was like technology. You know, it's, it's, it's a lot about technology. What can you do? What could all those people who were making iron things do once technology advanced and you had other opportunities? So this glue gun really made my day, for sure. So Ma is now quite you know, rep, you know, has <laughs> has gotten some uh, <laughs> some help uh, <laughs> as sometimes we need. You know, <laughs> a little prosthetics. Or, and, um, so she's in much better shape now. Uh, I had to take her apart, and put her back together again, but I was quite willing to do that. Um, and uh, so the one that the. Uh, the creature that's in the exhibit, can I choose this, this chair? Thank you. Mm -hmm. So this is, um, I brought four. So this is the one that's upstairs in the exhibit. This is um, the ballet dancer. So these, all of these, uh, <laughs> the wood, the stick, so to speak, is absolutely uh, that's it. That's what I found. It looked just like that. So then I looked at that and I said, wow, that looks kind of, you know, like a figure. So then I go back in, into my closet and I pull out this and that and the other thing and, she said, and then she can turn into something else. So there are shells and there are um, different features that she has. <laughs> um, so that was one that I made a, a while ago and brought over to show to the folks here at the museum. These are sort of, this is a more recent one. Actually, this is the most recent one that I made. Tell them what the wings are. Okay, so the wings are mango pits. Oh. <laughs> so those of you who enjoy mangoes, you have a new opportunity to start collecting them. And they dry out very nicely. I have done nothing but chew on them, you know, quite completely, and then leave them out of the kitchen sink to dry. That's what those are. So then there's obviously, you know, a pine cone. There's a little, um, this is a mushroom, actually, that was, we got up on the, the hill behind our house. These are two little uh, seeds from a, uh, I think a locust plant, actually. And these are two little bones that came from our, uh, a chicken that we had for dinner. <laughs> um, Tell them about the chess set. Oh yes, yeah. so there's a lot of possibility with bones. I showed you the one about the, uh, this is this one here. I'll get to the chess yeah, yeah. set. So this is, um, this again, this is a, this little bone here is actually from a dolphin that mm -hmm. was a skeleton. Um, and I looked at it like this for a long time, and I thought, gosh, it looks like a guitar, doesn't it? And then I thought, well, that's sort of boring. You know, just a guitar needs legs. <laughs> so that's why it turned out to be 
<laughs> more like this. Um, and uh, this little guy, I'm sure you all can all recognize, <laughs> those of you who have walked the beach can see mm -hmm. that this is a hermit crab. I mean a horseshoe horse crab, right, thank you. Um, that was, again, from Ocracoke Beach there. Um, so what I was going to point out, Suzanne mentioned the, the uh, chess set. So I've made two chess sets. There's one. <laughs> Thank you for finding that. This was the first. Um, oh, this was the second. This was our Thanksgiving turkey. Yeah. <laughs> 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 the vertebrae, you know. And if you look at these carefully, I mean, bones are incredible. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're magnificent pieces of architecture, you know, that we all share, right? right? And uh, there was a wonderful story. And, I, and in this little book, I've written up kind of stories of where things came from, how I got started and whatnot. And Diana, this will be your last story. Okay, this is it. <laughs> so my grandson, when he was four years old, we were in Vermont together. He's now 28. And we were snuggling. He said, Grandma, he's four now. He said, let's talk about bones. OK, I'm ready. So we talked. Sometime later, he's at elementary school, and he has to go to a Halloween party. And I had been in the woods and had come up with some deer uh, bones. So what I did is I collected the bones, got him in his sweatpants and sweatshirt, and sewed the bones onto <laughs> his, uh, to his sweat clothes. And let me tell you, he was the hit of the parade. <laughs> <laughs> the school parade, you know, but it's kind of family lore now. Um, so uh, lots of things can be done with bones. Um, I have a lot of respect for them. One of the things that I I, that I realize about this is so many of the things that I have gathered here were once alive, were once animal, animated in the world. And when I found them, they had given up that particular part of themselves. But I've kind of gathered them up and I'm trying to sort of give them a second life, so to speak, <laughs> another way of being in the world that, that other people can enjoy, and certainly that I do. So thank you very much. I'll make you sure if you want to look there, welcome to do that. Yeah, does anybody have a question or questions for any of the collectors? All available. David. Well, this is a question I ask every collector I meet, and um, and it's uh, after I've viewed the collection that they're showing me, I say, well, what else do you collect? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there's always an answer. So <laughs> if the collectors want to come up front here, you can stand up here and answer questions. Scott, you can ask. <laughs> my early days, of, I worked in archaeology. So I find that I constantly walk with my head. <laughs> <laughs> and so I collect all kinds of interesting rocks and bones and pottery and projectile points and <laughs> the odd quarter. <laughs> yeah. I guess I've collected everything. I collected coins when I was a kid and rocks. Now I have. Um, Photographs and paintings of Mongolian shamans and Mongolians, and so I have a lot of artwork. Um, my house is like when the Mo Mongolians come to visit, they say this is a Mongolian museum. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I feel so at home. <laughs> well, I guess I, I'm going to stick with the stick stone shells and bones. That's, those are four things. Uh, <laughs> when, uh, when w my husband and I moved from Washington State to Vermont, which we did uh, about 12 years ago, uh, we came with boxes of rocks, which I had collected. <laughs> and we had teenage boys help us. And they were, inc they were completely incredulous about what are we moving? You know, I said, that's rocks. <laughs> <laughs> they had to come with me. 
So, uh, <laughs> you know, you're, once you have a collection, you're not going to leave it behind. No. 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 Uh, I have another set of dishes that I collect. Um, walking wear from England in the 70s. They're uh, cups with feet, ostensibly. They wear little Mary Jane shoes and they have <laughs> Argyle socks, and it's, uh, they're very cute. Um, anything else, Tom? We're a family of collectors. My husband has a, a collection Yay. of velvet paintings, um, which sort of the whole house is very 70s at this point. Um, and lots and lots of uh, Kennedy ephemera, old horoscope magazines with his face on them and Kennedy jewelry and things like that. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Um, you, you, you mentioned the, the, the shamanic traditions in yes. Mongolia. Uh, and you're an inner, a Western energy worker. I wonder if you see connections there. That's a whole subject. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah an, an agent recently said I should write a book on that. You so should. anyway, um, yeah. yeah, I think that's one of the things that has really fascinated me about going to Mongolia is meeting the shamans and asking them the questions and trying to find out where that interface is you know, how they get over the veil to the other side and, and what might be different or the same the, w the way I do it and the way they do it. So I'm, I've interviewed about 15 shamans for this movie and also saw a bunch of ceremonies. And so um, I asked them a lot of those questions of, you know, what was happening and, you know, I, yeah, I'm really, it's, it's probably the thing I'm most uh, interested in going back to learn more. I don't feel I, I've learned everything about that. Or maybe you can't, but uh, yeah, I'm really, in, that's my most vital do interest. You have, do you have any of these uh, CDs, the DVDs in the library by any chance? I, I think this one is in. I can't remember if this is in. There's Gobi Women's Song, I think, is in there. Okay, great. Yeah. It's nice to know. Are any of the movies available digitally? They're all available digitally. Oh, they are. Yeah, and I have my um, card right here, and all the <laughs> documentary stuff is, is on there. Thank you. Great. Any other questions? If not, um, as I said, we encourage you to go see the exhibit, but also step around and, and look at some of the collection pieces that you were just shown. And you can ask individual questions if you'd like. So, thank, thank you, you all for coming. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.